blood doesn't discriminate. It hits everybody. The water came up 10 feet in the last three hours. You get a direct hit here, it's done. It's done. The tragedy is that Miami is cursed. It is literally in the bullseye of sea level rise. This city is absolutely doomed. No, what is going on in Miami? So it's just flood and flood and flood. We lost everything. We've always had extreme weather. But over the last 20 years, as climate change has accelerated, it has mutated and become more dangerous and unpredictable. From dry lightning, to the polar vortex, to bomb cyclones, and the fire nado. Welcome to the new reality. Welcome to mutant weather. As the global temperature rises, the planet is losing ground to the destructive power of extreme flooding. Inland, rapidly increasing precipitation is swamping cities, and in coastal areas, rising waters are threatening the very survival of entire communities. What is causing this mutant weather, and how destructive will it be? Heat records are getting broken. The last four years have been the four hottest years ever recorded on the planet full stop. The trend is very, very clear. It's accelerating so quickly in the oceans. Out of all the extra heat in the Earth's system, over 93% of it has transferred to the oceans. So what global warming really is, is heating the oceans. And as the oceans heat up, the rate of ice melt has tripled in the last two decades, tripling the rate of sea level rise what's already baked into the system because of how much energy has already been absorbed into the oceans and all of that warmth. We're looking at dozens of feet of sea level rise. For several decades, more and more industrial emissions are increasing levels of greenhouse gases that trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere. Global temperatures are expected to rise by 3.2 degrees Celsius. Glaciers and ice caps are melting faster than ever. Sea levels are rising, and the volume and intensity of rainfall is accelerating in many places. From Atlantic Canada to the southern United States to Ethiopia, Japan, and India, much of the Earth has been swamped by mutant floods. When you talk to people from all over the world, flooding shows up as, as the primary problem to climate change. Too much water in the wrong place. <laughs> Baton Rouge, Louisiana, August 2016. The state's second largest city is on the front lines of mutant weather, and lifelong Louisiana resident Rob Godet has seen it all. We get snow, we get floods, hurricanes, of course. We're frequently told it's going to flood here. So when you see it, you don't really think about it. You're like, okay, it's gonna be another flood. We get localized flooding all the time. A typical Louisiana summer storm is brewing in the area. In Louisiana, it rains every day during the summer. When you can see the dark clouds over here, they are thunderstorms coming. Baton Rouge averages about 60 inches a year, so Rob doesn't see any reason for alarm until he turns on the television. In La Place, Louisiana, rising water stranded some residents. Rain caused massive flooding. I was watching the news, and people are being rescued on television by helicopters. The governor is calling in the National Guard to help. At that moment, I said, wow, they said it would flood, but they didn't say anything about helicopter rescue. Emergency declarations are now in effect across portions of the state. I've lived in Louisiana my whole life. Never in 50 years had I seen any flooding to the degree, even inside of homes. Oh my God. The whole streets, the river. Entire towns were flooded. The water's still rising. Where is all this water coming from? There's a neighborhood back here underwater. People just can't get out. And that was the moment I realized this was going to be a major event. 
If temperatures are warmer across the globe, both on land and in the ocean, we could see more moisture-laden storms. Warm air can hold more moisture. The supersaturated warm air unleashes relentless rains and storms on Louisiana. And in each thunderstorm, they were filled with tropical moisture. These are moisture-laden thunderstorms. So just tons of rainfall out of each one of these. And you start training thunderstorms over the same city for days that's already prone to flooding, you've got a big problem. About two hours drive southeast of Baton Rouge, Louisiana is Isle de Jean Charles. The island's residents are being driven from their homes by severe flooding caused by rising sea levels. The few remaining face a choice. Stay put as the flooding swallows their land or flee for higher, drier ground, becoming America's first climate refugees. You had a lot more land before. Behind you there, you could walk from here to Pointe de Chien. Now it's all water. Over Anthony Verdon's lifetime, a staggering 98% of the island had disappeared into the Gulf of Mexico. His friend, Rocky Bobuen, sees troubling changes on the local waterways. You look around you now, it's just open water everywhere. This was one time, duck ponds and marshes. Now you look around, looks like you're sitting in a lake right here. Edison Dardar is a councilman of the Isle de Jean Charles band of the Biloxi Chittimaca Choctaw tribe. I see right here, from that point, 25 years ago, all of that was grass, you know. In 1955, the island measured over 22,000 acres. Now, barely 300 acres remain. Its population peaked at 400. Today, only 85 residents are left. Eventually, the island is not going to be an island anymore. Every year, when you look at it, more and more of the land is gone. Like Edison Dardar, Hope Caldwell is a member of the Biloxi Chittimaca Choctaw tribe. When I used to come out here when I was a kid with my grandparents come fishing, this was all like land. It was like all the marsh. It's nothing but water now and just washed away. Now you see them tree with that? The salt water killed all the oak trees. They look like skeletons. They've been gone for the last 40 years. Isle de Jean Charles is a harbinger of dislocations that will afflict people across the globe. This is one of the calling cards of climate change, changes in sea level, which literally may drive people from their native countries and, and, and end up with a generation of what we call climate refugees. Disadvantaged populations are going to continue to bear the brunt of floods, heat waves, and hurricanes. August 2016. The downpour in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, is reaching historic proportions. 20 inches of rain is swelling rivers to record levels. This is literally the worst rain we've ever experienced in my lifetime. We had storms moving from north to south. Going over the Bayou Manchac Bridge. Lots and lots of flooding everywhere. The storm really caught us all off guard. It's Rob Godet's first encounter with mutant weather. The rain kept coming for about five days straight. Look to the right here. The water is right up to the roadway. This gigantic building right here is totally flooded. All underwater. That white thing's the top of a U-Haul. The Manchac Bayou is very high. There's water on the road up ahead. I got an emergency vehicle coming up behind me. This has thousands of people on this road backed up for miles and miles. It looks like they're desperately trying to keep the water off the road, but it's not working. With floodwaters reaching dangerous levels, Rob must keep moving to make it home. There's one spot in the road where the water's going over it, and it's pretty deep. You cannot see the sides of the road. You're literally driving into a lake, and you just have to keep pulling forward. If you go off to the side either direction, you feel like you could end up being swept off. That was uh, scary. It was pretty harrowing. 
The flooding continued for a week after that. People are stranded. The interstate is closed, so they're rerouting traffic. <laughs> Neighborhoods are all pretty seriously flooded. That water's deep right there in the front yard. Rob Godet doesn't know it yet, but researchers are determining that the 2016 Louisiana storm had 20% more rain than 30 years ago, and the root of the cause is a changing climate. And you're like, where did this water come from? Just inundating cities after city. We've got more water coming down over shorter periods of time in greater volume, hitting a land mass that has less capability to absorb it or handle it. When the water comes down, it doesn't absorb. It runs off very quickly to the lowest location into receiving water body systems, and that too contributes to flooding. It swelled all the bayous and all the streams through South Louisiana, and it just made its way south. It hit city after city after city. To have it overnight flood 150,000 homes was just surreal. It's people walking down the middle of the road. Miraculously, Rob's house is spared, but the flood has a profound impact on him. You can feel the suffering of your community because it was everywhere. I was really compelled to get involved. I knew I could help. That flood really changed my life. Miami Beach, Florida. Playground of the rich and fabulous. And frequently visited by extreme weather and flooding. Oh my God. Flooding downtown Miami. Craziness. And a city less than four feet above sea level in places, compared to New York City at less than 10 feet and Boston at 45. It was built literally on water. Miami Beach is a sandbar. Artist and climate activist Xavier Cortada understands Miami's dire straits, and he foresees a devastated city by the end of the century. Most of our community will be submerged with three, four feet of water. He uses art as a means of warning residents of coming sea level rise. And as you continue going to six feet, eight feet, it's over. Warning Miami of this existential flooding threat is Xavier Cortada's mission. It's a mission that starts 8,000 miles away. I went to the South Pole as a National Science Foundation fellow and I created a piece they liked and invited me to come. And that was a piece about global climate change. The scientists there hit me with the reality that the very ice that I was looking at, the very ice that I was standing on, threatened to drown my city. The only place I've ever called home. When he returns home, Xavier finds Miami is not interested in climate change. This was back when Miami wasn't talking about sunny day floods. None of that conversation existed. In fact, climate change was, a, was hardly a word. No, what is going on in Miami? <laughs> the term sunny day flood is used to dismiss Miami's frequent flooding. Flooding not caused by rain or storm surges, but the result of rising sea levels exacerbated by high tides. This type of flooding has doubled in the coastal United States over the past 30 years and is expected to dramatically worsen in the coming decades. Yo, look at all this water. I watched people putting on rubber boots and just walking. They call it sunny day flooding because when I was there, Rick Scott, who's now senator, was uh, governor and he forbade people in the state to use the terms global warming or climate change. And so they called it sunny day flooding, where you had these areas where basically the ocean's already coming up over and covering streets. Wow, that's insane. That's all sunny day flooding is. It's a cop-out term introduced to not talk about what's happening. Here's what's happening in Miami-Dade, and it's not good. Since 1930, South Florida has had over a foot of sea level rise. We could be at another two feet, according to the U.S. government, by 2039. My guess it'll be faster than that. Despite this, Miami's runaway growth continues. In 
2016, there were 400 new high-rise condo buildings being built. It's crazy that we're still building like this. At some point, it's going to be over. Before it's all over, Xavier Cortada has work to do. What many Miamians don't understand is that Antarctica is coming to town. Everything we know and love in due time will change. Across the globe, mutant floods are wreaking havoc. In Spain, inland areas are swamped from excessive rain. The sea level rise is washing away seaside communities in India, and in Japan, highly populated coastal cities are drowning. Isle de Jean Charles, Louisiana, birthplace of America's first climate refugees. This fragile island is exposed to the ravages of mutant weather and flooding, in part because of man-made decisions. Over the years, the oil industry has dredged miles upon miles of canals. These are all oil and gas canals that were dug, and it let saltwater intrusion come here. I remember swimming in here, and there's this beautiful, nice, clean water now, you know. It's almost all fresh water, and that's all salt water. They get sharks right here across. They get sharks right in there now. Sharks. Before, the canals are cut, water couldn't come in. It stopped. The canals are cut, now the storm comes, the water had a way to come in. You get these strong waters coming in from storms, or even high tides, you don't even need storms. You know, the more currents flowing through something, the more damage it does. Eventually, the marsh is gonna disappear, you ain't gonna have none left. That disappears, then you just have also sitting in the middle of the open water. This has all been open and cleared. Right back there, that was more grass and stuff. But since the pipelines, everything's uh, just, it's nothing but water now and just washed away. There's nothing to protect us because all the barrier islands that we had around Louisiana are gone. And most of them are gone because the oil fields dug canals right through the middle of them and just washed them away. That's a plain and simple fact. We've removed the natural infrastructure that was originally here, the forest, the fields, the wetlands that were originally here. They're now gone. A month ago, heavy tide, waves pounding, pounding. This is water right here. Had sharks swimming in the yard. The water just came right in. There was nothing to stop it. I'm telling you, I'm 52 years old. I've watched it with my own eyes. It's getting worse and worse every year. It's a cruel irony that the fossil fuel industry supplies much needed jobs on Isle de Jean Charles, but the industry's greenhouse gas emissions are the first link in the chain of climate change, from warming to melt to sea level rise and flooding. Right now on the planet, about 80 to 81% of world energy supply comes from coal, oil, and natural gas. That's where we get our energy on the planet. Three fossil fuel-based sources that when burnt, they put CO2 in the atmosphere, which contributes to climate change. But when we have an excess of that greenhouse gas, like carbon dioxide, which is the primary player, uh, that's when we begin to worry about changes to our climate system. August 2016. On the rivers around Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the mutant floodwaters are cresting to two and a half feet, shattering records. President Obama has declared a state of emergency. It's going to be hopefully a lot more than... Rob Godet watches local rescue resources overload. The authorities were overwhelmed, and so citizens stepped up and helped. Get in your car, gas it up and drive here, and we'll figure out the rest when you get here. It was that bad. By a man shackle the floods bank. We needed people to come down and help. It's coming hard over that, that roadway right there. People coming back here with boats, getting as far as they can on the road and then letting into the water. Probably one out of every two citizens has a boat. There's a boat there, there's a boat here. They got in their boats and started helping people get out of homes. The local volunteers quickly give their rescue effort a name, the Cajun Navy. We met some gentlemen here, that we, their dogs has left. We picked up a, uh, a lady, she's trying to get to her dad. We had a boat, so we're trying to do whatever we can. 
in our time of crisis and disaster, so this is time for everybody to pull together if they can. Louisiana is known as a Cajun state. We're very proud of that Cajun name, and uh, somebody blurted out, actually on Facebook Live, we just need to form our own Cajun Navy, and that was it. The first time I went out and helped was um, Sunday, August 15th, and it was actually my wedding anniversary, and got with a friend of mine. All right now we're in Prairieville where the water is starting to rise from the Amy River. And there's a neighborhood back here. It's probably underwater. Let me turn around. So there's some boat coming out right now with some people on it. Water is actually rushing. It's going pretty fast. When it hits the middle of the road, it drops off pretty hard. I don't think I can go that way. The water's too high. So we're just going to walk down it. Here it goes. I'm going in, guys. We found an area where the water was creeping up the road. Just trying to get down here and see if anybody needs any help. You could see it while we're sitting there. You could see the water slowly rising. Do you have any water in your house already? We lost everything. But we got out safely, and uh, all our friends are safe, so that's the main thing. One minute, you're fine. An hour later, there's water in your home, and there's nothing you can do about it. Some more people are still back there. Man, it's still rising out here. This spot was all concrete right here, and it's now covered with water. I honestly think the water has come up since I pulled in. Here we go. I don't know how close I am to the curb. I think I just hit it. It's definitely nerve wracking. I feel the car tilt to the right and I'm thinking, am I going off the side? I've gotten through the deepest of it. Dang. Harrowing. I just choked through three feet. See, we can barely get back as it is. It was just a surreal moment to see what was normally a road have boat traffic on it. Water is still rising. The people in the boats with their possessions and you know, not knowing what was going to happen to their home, having left their home with water in it. Did you get your stuff out? No. Let's go help. Nobody's just sitting around watching. Everyone's coming together as one. I'm just wondering what's left, if anything. Everything that I had is gone. Everything. The sense of loss that they had, you could just see oh my God. loss in their eyes, and you felt it. This is my entire life that I worked my entire life for it just washed away. It's hard. It's like the end of your life, end of your world, you know, having to start over like that. We work so hard for it. You wake up one day and you have water inundating your homes throughout your state and you need help. How do you do that? The whole town just washed away overnight. On Isle de Jean Charles, Louisiana, Hope Caldwell and the few remaining residents are watching extreme weather strike more frequently and with greater power. The weather has changed tremendously around here. Stronger storms means more damage, and you know how the weather creates these stronger storms. You know, the way it works, the hotter the water is in the Gulf, the bigger the storms can get because the hot water fuels the storms. It could take one good storm, like Katrina. If it came through here, I think it could wipe out, it would wipe that all out. Once able to weather high tides and big storms, Isle de Jean Charles doesn't stand a chance against today's unpredictable mutant weather. You get a direct hit here, it's done. It's done. All it takes that one storm, you're gonna wash the houses away. People will be drowning. And in July 2019, it looks like one bad storm is coming. Tropical storm bearing has been upgraded to a category two hurricane. Expect 200 millimeters of rain. We are quite concerned. It remains a very dangerous storm, particularly with regard to the amount of water uh, that could be dropped in those areas in an already 
full river basin. It's what we call compound flooding, and we're seeing this more and more, where basically we have elevated saltwater levels for a couple days, and we have torrential rain, and basically the rain is impeded in its drainage. Where's that rain going to go? Flooding is imminent. There's nowhere for Hurricane Barry's rains to go. A voluntary evacuation order is issued for Isle de Jean Charles. Our ability to conduct search and rescue operations will deteriorate as this storm continues to come ashore. The storm advances, and Anthony Verdon can't get out of town in time. This is Isle of Jean Charles, on the 13th, about 2 a.m. The water came up 10 foot 2 inches. It never, it never came up that high before, ever. 10 feet in the last three hours. It just overflowed into the front canal. Had to flood here for four days. No power in the water back here. It's never been that high before, never. We have requests for help, particularly in Terrebonne Parish. Number of people stranded. You're able to launch two of our helicopters and the rescue of those people. Anthony Verdon has a ringside seat as mutant weather swamps Isle de Jean Charles. The day after the storm, I'm out here with a net, literally scooping up crabs. Well, I seen fish coming over, trying to get away. You oh, know? Look at that crab! Water is up to here. Never seen anything like that. Mutant flooding like this is supposed to come from so-called 100-year storms. But now people are finding that they're having what used to be the one in a 100-year event, might have two of those within a five-year period or something like that. And increasingly so then, people are starting to realize that, boy, there really is a change in the dynamic of the system. And there's a tangible aftermath to that dynamic change. Storm surge came from that way and just broke all the bridge up. I mean, it was a perfect bridge. Now look at it. That bridge has been there for 60 years. Water pressure coming down the canal. It broke it just from the storm surge. I mean, break 12 by 12, just break them all. Just because of the water coming in on category one. You get a category three or four, you're going to wash the houses away. The island is increasingly defenseless against progressively extreme rains and storm surges. You can imagine a wall of water coming at you and it hitting a sponge before it gets to you. If you have marsh, it's a natural hurricane barrier. You take the marsh away, what happens? Storm comes, now the island is exposed to it. That'll be a direct impact for these storm surges. So the wall is actually going to hit the islands versus having some cushion before it. Back in the day, it was bad hurricanes, but they had land that would stop it, stop that water from coming in. Once this marsh is gone, there's like no protection anymore. In Miami, Florida, Xavier Cortada wants to both warn and inspire his hometown to change while there's still time. Beginning with his installations, showing that Miami is less than 10 feet above sea level. They need to know what's coming. And as an artist, I try to make the invisible visible. Because unlike a hurricane that's at the water's edge and you can see and you can track and you understand that it's coming, climate change and sea level rise is something uh, that isn't so visible. The goal of Xavier's project is to open Miami's eyes to the coming calamity before it's too late. It's literally a vertical nursery of mangrove propagules. This is extraordinary. Yeah. The idea is, is uh, for you to take this and uh, plant it at your home uh, next to a white flag with your elevation on it. How many of these are you going to do? 25,000. Oh, my God. Let's go to this app, and when you type your address, it shows you the elevation of your property, exactly how many feet above sea level it is. And people don't realize that most of us live at seven, six feet above. Is that it? You live at seven feet above sea level. I want you to think of the coast not being at the water's edge on the bay, but literally being beneath your feet. I want you to visualize what Miami will look like as the sea levels rise to your elevation. Xavier wants Miami and surrounding areas to take more action. I don't think there will be a Miami in another century. Miami is literally in the bullseye of sea level rise uh, because of the way currents go and wind patterns. This city is absolutely doomed to sea level rise. There's no question about that. 
The ocean has came to the street. Look at this. One of the biggest threats of climate change is sea level rise. But sea level rise is just not related to water melting from the ice sheets. It's also related to something called thermal expansion. Uh, when water warms, it expands. And so that elevates the sea level in addition to the water being added from melting ice sheets. In Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and the surrounding areas, it's seven days since the historic flooding began, with damage of at least $10 billion, and 13 are dead. There's a helicopter flying above head. There's still active rescues going on. When you have a disaster like this, the authorities are just simply overwhelmed. There's no existing systems standing by in place, ready to take care of you know hundreds of thousands of people whose homes are flooded. Emergency personnel, they're doing their best, but they can't save millions of people. So that's when citizens get involved and we begin to fill the gaps in care that the authorities just can't handle when they're overwhelmed with calls for help. Coming in thousands. In the meantime, it's been a local volunteer effort of epic proportions. I've called around and offered to help. I'm gonna step out and help load some sandbags in the back. Everybody can see what a community in Louisiana does when people are in need. Climate change is not only mutating weather, it's also forcing citizens to respond to disasters themselves when emergency personnel are spread too thin. A flood event can be so overwhelming that 911 and local emergency management just get overwhelmed really quickly, and all of a sudden you get things like the Cajun Navy, the Texas Navy. These are just citizens, concerned citizens with a motorboat that are going to go out and, and help people. During Hurricane Katrina, people died in attics, bodies were found um, in homes, um, floating in the water, because they, you know, if you're stranded out a mile from help, nobody knows you're there. You're, you know, you're not going to make it. As a software developer with social media savvy, Rob Godet brings his skills to the Cajun Navy and creates a citizen dispatch system. When you have 150,000 homes flood, you're going to have homes that are off the beaten path where people are stranded, and they'll call 911 and get busy signals and no response. So what people started doing, they went to Facebook and said, help me. Please send somebody to pick me up. I'm stranded and we need help right now. Rob's system takes requests for help and then dispatches the Cajun Navy. We worked around the clock. I remember being up at three in the morning and listening to our walkie talkie app and our dispatchers are sending people out to rescue cats or deliver water or go pull somebody out of a house. Deadly, destructive floods like those in Louisiana are forcing citizens to fend for themselves and go to extraordinary lengths to save neighbors. The Louisiana flood was really a, a baptism of fire. We figured out ways to help our citizens, really by hook or nook. During the Louisiana floods, the Cajun Navy, we estimate rescued about 30,000 people. In Miami, Florida, this coastal city will be one of the first places in the world to bear the brunt of rising sea levels. Climate change is many of the things that we projected to happen, things like sea level rise, are happening at a much faster rate than even we projected 20 or 30 years ago. Today, if you drive around, you see two Miamis. You see a very wealthy, glitzy Miami. And then you see another Miami, and sadly, there's a stark distinction of people who are just struggling to make it every day. People who are doing everything they can to make their children have a better future. People who are struggling to make it work here in Miami. Artist and climate change activist Xavier Cortada worries about Miami's future. Sea levels are rising, threatening to swamp the city. The lower lying, poor areas will suffer most because those will become the places that we're not going to invest our resources in. We're not going to elevate those roads. Faced with this grim reality, Xavier is about to commit an act of artistic protest. 
That means, of course, is that we're at seven feet elevation. I like the Latin seven there. <laughs> I asked people to take a flag and put the elevation of their property on it. And as sea levels rise in the coming years, the city of Miami and Miami Beach will be flooded from the ocean and from beneath. I wanted to let folks in Miami understand that our seashore isn't just at the water's edge as they see it, but it's also beneath their feet because the salt water doesn't just come in as the sea level rises from the Atlantic, but also the salt water comes up beneath your feet through the aquifer. This process is called saltwater intrusion. Rising sea levels pollute freshwater aquifers, the source of drinking water for coastal cities in southern Florida. This is not a white flag of surrender. It's surrendering those ideas that, that this is always going to be without change. It's more about accepting what's to come, surrendering to the fact that nature is going to come in a way that we hadn't planned for and begin to plan towards that. I went around with City Engineer of Miami Beach, and they were in the process of raising several of the streets in Miami Beach one meter. They're convinced we're going to try to save Miami Beach, which building a wall or raising streets to try to keep the ocean out, um, it's laughable knowing what's already baked into the system. We have failed to alter our behavior, and now nature's soon going to do it for us. On Isle de Jean Charles, Louisiana, uncontrollable flooding means time is running out for residents to make a choice, stay or go. When you wake up, you know, and you got four foot of water in your house, it's like, do you want to do, go through this again? Anthony Verdon has made his choice and now only lives part time on the island. The few people here, they've been here forever, you know? Most of them are Native Americans. Probably about 35 or 40 people left back here. Like Mr. Anderson's daughter, he's been here for 70 years. He said it's just getting smaller and smaller, more salt water, you know? When I was a kid, yeah, we had a body someplace around there. But they, they had a lot of moss, yeah. For many members of the Biloxi Chittimaca Choctaw tribe, like Edison Dardar, the island is their only home. That's my house right there. Forcibly moved to Isle de Jean Charles more than 170 years ago, this indigenous community is once again losing their land. Recent coastal restoration efforts have not been able to save Isle de Jean Charles. The damage is irreversible. I mean, we were born and raised here. Every day, living off the land. People used to trap muskrat. Now we got crab, we got shrimp, we got fish, we got oysters. Right there. 35 years ago, I was getting $7 a pound for shrimp. Now we're getting a dollar a pound for the shrimp. It's changed so much. Everything in the environment is getting harder and harder. Some residents are choosing to go before it's too late. That's the road for me out of here. Hopefully it goes back so I can head up. If people moved away, it's because they're just scared. The road getting out of here, the island road, it floods when we get high tides a lot of days. For those that remain, the United States government wants to move them off of Isle de Jean Charles, and yet some refuse to leave, like many members of the Biloxi Chittimaca Choctaw tribe. Us being Native American, we were here first before anybody was here. You know, it's like, isn't this really our land? It's just going to ruin the whole way of life. It's, it's horrible. It really is. This is five generations that live here. To lose this and to be moved, it's just like losing uh, a part of them, you know? It's like losing a part of them. This is their land, and they're not moving for no, you know, no one or nothing. They're going to live here until it's gone. This is my, my home, my land, all my life. When you talk about moving, I know I ain't moving for sure. Their lives are already disrupted. They know that their whole way of being is changing, and they're going to have to leave a place where 
they and their parents and their grandparents and their great grandparents have, have always been. And especially talking about indigenous communities, watching people that not only are they going to have to leave, but their entire spirituality, their subsistence lifestyle, everything is being completely disrupted to the point where they're going to even have to relocate. And, and this means their whole existence is now being called into question. In Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the mutant floods have changed Rob Godet's view of weather. As a native Louisianian, I've lived here my whole life, and I've definitely seen an uptick in storms and disasters. You would never think you'd have a home underwater. It was like, where did this come from? It, it made no sense at all. They say it was a 500 or 1,000 year flood. We thought it was, and then a year later, we had the same thing happen in Texas. We look at this and we wonder, is weather changing? Is this gonna be a more common event? Researchers project extreme precipitation events will increase this century, bringing as much as 50% more heavy rain, leading to more catastrophic floods. The storm caused widespread devastation throughout South Louisiana. Nobody was immune, you know, rich, poor, it didn't matter, the water didn't care. 25th Street is gone underwater. A flood is a different disaster than a tornado or a hurricane. A flood doesn't discriminate, it hits everybody. You can have a tornado that'll cut a path where you have one house destroyed and the houses next door to them are fine. Well, here, the entire communities are destroyed. As the planet and oceans heat, the age of mutant flooding is upon us. Sea level rise is coming. And unlike a hurricane, the water will not recede. And unlike a hurricane, it doesn't just target one location, it targets every place across this nation where land touches water. In fact, every place across planet Earth where land touches water. It's already evident that coastal cities and low-lying lands are facing rising waters, either from extreme weather or rising sea levels. But based on paleoclimate records, there's no escaping the coming inundation. Oh my God. Last time there was this much CO2 in the atmosphere, seas were anywhere from 18 to 30 to 40 meters higher than they are right now. And so based on that alone, what coastal city can survive. Is there any coastal city anywhere on the planet that won't have to be abandoned to the sea or moved entirely? Billions of people live in coastal cities and on vulnerable floodplains, all at risk of catastrophic floods. Each year, more and more people are forced to reckon with this new reality. How are you going to move New York City? How are you going to move Tokyo? Where are all those people going to go? What happens in those places? But that is the reality that is upon us right now with what's already baked into the system. Best case scenario, you're going to have to move every coastal city on the planet. It's hard to move a metropolis. It's not like moving a small group of people down the bayou in Louisiana. It's a more complex thing when you're dealing with 7 million people in South Florida. If inescapable flooding is the grim future, can humankind survive the coming mutant weather? I'm telling you, I'm 52 years old. I've watched it with my own eyes. It's hotter and hotter. It's just changing. It really is. Well, eventually the marsh is going to disappear. You ain't going to have none left. That's the way I see it. Many people have lost everything several times. and. You know, it, it, they don't want to leave. They want to stay. They, they, they stay where, it's where their family is. It's where they were born and raised, and it's what they know. And so they just rebuild and get ready for the next one. What else are you going to do? I mean, you can stay and fight it and hope things get better, but it's not going to get better because of the climate change. Nothing we can do about the climate, you know? It's changing. You have a lot of people around the world who are going to be dislocated in the millions. They're in areas that are flooding or it's drought or there's desertification, they simply cannot live there. When people talk about, oh, we still have 10 years to avert the catastrophe, this is nonsense. We're in it right now. Oh my God, Mom! 
this came so fast, it took out houses and cars and everything in the blink of an eye. Get out of here, go! I've never experienced anything like this happening to such a grand scale. It came as a battering ram that was four, five, six feet high at 30 miles an hour. Seemed like half the mountain came down. We've always had extreme weather, but over the last 20 years, as climate change has accelerated, it has mutated and become more dangerous and unpredictable. Whoa! From dry lightning to the polar vortex to bomb cyclones and the fire nado. Welcome to the new reality. Welcome to mutant weather. As the climate changes, the structure of the very Earth beneath our feet is changing too, becoming unstable. We have earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, floods. Even climate change itself can be considered a hazard. Um, and what we're seeing is a change in the frequency and magnitude of some of those hazards. When a warming Earth becomes destabilized, the land we rely on is compromised affecting landslides, sinkholes, and mudslides in Europe, Asia, and the Americas. Every part of this planet is recording different kinds of changes that are associated with climate change right now. For 200 years, humanity has burned fossil fuels for energy, releasing chemicals into the atmosphere that had been trapped in the Earth for millions of years fundamentally changing both the atmosphere and the geosphere. So in a very short period of time, human climate change has influenced these systems on the scale of geologic change that would normally take millions of years to occur. Moving carbon from the Earth to the atmosphere traps more and more heat. And as the planet heats up, it triggers unexpected chains of events. The geosphere and the atmosphere are linked, of course, because the solid Earth uh, is covered by the gases that form the atmosphere and that, that we rely on for life. The atmosphere weathers Earth materials, um, changes the composition of materials at the surface, and that affects the entire geosphere. Supercharged storms drop more water, saturating hillsides until they collapse. Glaciers that have subdued volcanoes for thousands of years begin to melt. Underground torrents of water erode the earth until it collapses. As extreme rainfall is becoming much more likely, we're seeing big changes in the probability of extreme rainfall. And extreme rainfall is one of the major triggers of mudslides and landslides. Montecito, California, a wealthy community where Marco Farrell and his family lives they have already begun to feel the effects of climate change. We had six, seven years of a pretty, pretty devastating drought here. To begin with, we live in a semi-arid desert. The hills were just absolutely tinder dry. In early December 2017, when a fire started. And we got the big fire, big fire right there. <laughs> Fires today are hotter than they've ever been. They're bigger than they've been, and they're burning more deeply into the ground. Santa Barbara and Ventura County had experienced one of the largest fires in California history. Mark Hall has been a member of the all-volunteer Santa Barbara Swiftwater Search and Rescue Team for five years. A fire of that proportion and burning that large and that hot completely destroys all vegetation it goes so fast and so hot that there's nothing that is in its way that doesn't burn to the ground. And the chaparral, which is the, the plants that grow on our foothills here, have a lot of oil in them. And it vaporized that oil. And that oil then fell back down onto the ash and created a hydrophobic surface layer. So water didn't penetrate it at all. It actually would beat up. Fires transform the surface 
of the burned ground and create a layer at or just below the surface that actually repels water. In many areas after a wildfire, you get a very high runoff that occurs because the water cannot penetrate this hydrophobic layer and the underlying soil. All that water has to go somewhere, and if it falls on steep slopes, it will typically run down stream courses and erode material and trigger failures that then become uh, debris flows. After the fire, the Office of Emergency Services and other first responders held several town hall meetings and press conferences to try to educate our community as to what dangers lay above us as we entered into our storm season. On January 8th, a heavy band of moisture approaches Montecito saw the storm develop and march towards us, and we knew that there was a significant chance for very, very heavy rainfall. It was probably one of the largest storms that we had seen in years. So the day of January 8th, we had evacuated much of uh, Montecito. Uh, some people think that they're safer in their own home and have been through enough of these that they think that they can survive. So it puts first responders in, in harm's way and it also puts um, the, the public in harm's way when they don't heed these uh, evacuations. Marco Farrell and his family are among the residents who decide to stay in their own home despite the approaching storm. People were exhausted. They'd evacuated some three, four, five times. It's just emotionally and physically exhausting. The storm didn't come at 10 o'clock as expected. We waited and waited. I went to sleep and laid out my, my rain gear and my boots just so that I could roll right out of bed and, and right into them and, and, and go, go to action if, if I needed to. And I really, in my head, was preparing for battle. About 3 o'clock in the morning, the rain started coming. And they came as hard as I've ever seen it. It was like being in a car wash. I've never seen that much rain come down uh, that heavily. We've got two factors coming together. More water coming down over shorter periods of time, hitting a landmass that has less capability to absorb it or handle it, and it runs off very quickly. I woke up to the most horrendous rain I'd ever heard. I went out, opened the front door, and it was dark, a lot of rain, but not as much water in the street as I expected to see. And we all of a sudden heard a gigantic explosion and a flash of light uh, up on the hillside. And it was very strange seeing a fire in the middle of pouring rain, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. When I walked back out front, there's all of a sudden this incredibly brilliant orange light. I couldn't figure out why the sun was coming up there two hours it was before it was supposed to come up there. It just didn't make sense. Virtually everyone in Montecito sees the fireball blazing in the sky, but no one knows what it is. I was awoken by my roommate in the room who said there's a giant fireball in the sky. Andy Rupp, a paramedic with the Montecito Fire Department, has lived in Southern California for his whole life. We went out, we tried to make access across the district to this fireball in the sky. Mike, get in the car. And we saw mud coming down the streets that we were trying to pass. We thought there was a lot of rain that was causing mud coming off the hillside and going down the streets. A friend of mine called and said, hey, I'm coming to pick you up. There's a fire in the hills. And I said, I'm on my way. I was about three blocks away. And then there was big noise. I turned and ran as fast as I could. I fled for my life, yelling, flash flood, flash flood, flash flood. It isn't a flash flood. It's much worse. It's the debris flow. A debris flow is a fast moving, uh, highly fluid, uh, water rich, uh, flow of material down a slope and by definition would have larger 
uh, material within it. So it could have uh, big boulders, uh, mud, sand, uh, tree stems. We knew exactly where the flame was coming from and we tried to make it up to that area. Mark heads towards the high pressure gas line, which is the source of the fireball. But every single road that we came across, there were either downed trees or power lines that kept us from being able to get through. And that's when we ran into the active debris flows. There were window high on our vehicles, which would be about four feet deep. In them, you could see giant logs, trees, pieces of homes flowing through. It was a sea of mud. As I got to the house and I pulled out my phone to start to try to film it, it was a, a whole line of logs and, 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 and boulders and cars and debris and just, just macerating its way down the street. And I'd totally forgotten that my friend was, was coming up to, to pick me up. And I looked down the street and I see his headlights. And I go, oh, no. Oh, no. And I could hear it getting louder and louder. Turn around. Get out of here. Go. Oh, my God. Mom. Close the door. Get, get, get ready to go out. Pick that up. In the Pacific Ranges in British Columbia, Canada, the melting ice cover on top of volcanoes like Mount Meager poses a unique threat. Mount Meager hasn't erupted for 2,400 years, but scientists have observed toxic gas belching from holes in the shrinking glacier cap. The key thing about most volcanoes is they spend most of their life falling down. And Mount Meager is a case in point. We can see every year that the glacier is melting back and how that meltwater starts to interact with this already rotten rock because of those volcanic gases. That is starting to make, we believe, the mountain more unstable. In 2010, 50 million cubic meters of material thundered down Mount Meager's slopes, the largest such event in recorded Canadian history and the next one could be even worse. Our interest in right now for any future activity is how the glaciers and the water on the mountain are changing. The pore space, spaces between the grains of sand and rock, that can make things expand and make that rock weak. And if it's too weak, eventually gravity will be that final trigger that pulls the mountain down. Possibly, if we had a massive landslide, much, much bigger than in 2010, could it even destabilize the magma system underneath and lead to a volcanic eruption? So climate is playing a role on destabilizing this volcano. In Land O'Lakes, Florida, a region known as Sinkhole Alley, cracks that appear in drywall or a suddenly crooked step may be the only warning before the earth opens up to swallow cars, homes, and even people. Florida is the sinkhole capital of the world. We're also the sinkhole capital of, of Florida. We have more sinkholes in Pasco County than any other county throughout the state. Sinkholes occur in areas where we have soluble rocks. Much of Florida is underlain by limestone, and limestone is a soluble rock, so at depth, uh, below the surface, you've got water that's, I would argue, so almost eating away at the limestone and producing caverns at depth. And over time, you eventually reach a point where the ground left's unsupported to the point where it actually collapses. So you get the ground collapsing above one of these uh, open cavities. Andrew Fossa, the director of emergency services for Pasco County, is on the ground the day that a massive sinkhole swallows two homes in Land O'Lakes. As climate change creates more powerful rainstorms, the increased water flow can erode the earth in the region until the ground suddenly opens up. Lake Paget was a giant lake. Then they decided to build a community over it, so they brought in fill and they packed it down, brought in fill, and started taking portions of that lake away to the point they built a residential section on it. 
it's very hard to convince people to not build there when they've never seen water there, they never expect to see water there, but they don't realize the dynamic in the system has now changed. Mother Nature will take back what you have taken from it. So that lake, having an aquifer underneath it being fed, that eventually starts to erode away. And Mother Nature is going to start taking that back. So that compacted soil is not natural earth soil. It was put in there. So it starts eroding away underneath to the point that a sinkhole forms. July 14th, 2017. A normal day begins in Lando Lakes, Florida. As the community prepares to go to work for the day, an unusual dip in the turf foreshadows the destruction to come. Doors started to not shut. Um, cracks in the walls started appearing. The garage door was coming off its hinges, and there was a, some huge cracks in the floor that we were noticing. We could feel them even underneath the carpet. Fire rescue got a call out there for ground movement for a depression. And as they were pulling up, the crew actually witnessed the ground settling in. The resident that called them in, they went over to the house, they're knocking on the door, and they could physically hear the house cracking. The scary thing about sinkholes is they occur unexpectedly, very rapidly, and uh, without warning. We never imagined that something like this would happen anywhere, even close to us. It was pretty scary. I mean, the road was collapsing right in front of us. This house in front of us over here, we were watching everything just kind of get eaten by Mother Nature. It was, it was intense. In Montecito, California, the debris flow reaches Marco Farrell. He barely makes it home to warn his parents about the wave of mud that's smashing through his community. I went and checked the front door right as this huge wall of debris hit, hit our house, and it sounded like a, a, a huge dump truck just sloshed a huge thing of pancake batter. It was just this wet, really wet, heavy sound to it. And the kitchen door breached. That was the scariest part for me. It was just the most horrendous, violent noise. And instantly, it was knee-high everywhere, mud, and it was rising. In the kitchen, it was counter-high. There's nothing I could do. I'm sorry, you guys. And the whole house was shaking. It was getting hit by boulders. Everyone stay calm. We've tried to make access to this fireball in the sky, and we weren't able to. And now we've got a call for a woman who was trapped behind a security gate on someone's yard. Dylan, go ahead. When we arrived to the lady, she was covered head to toe in mud. You know, I was thinking, OK, here, here we go. This is, this is what they talked about. We'll see what sort of devastation we have. And she was the most emotionally distressed I've ever seen someone. It was odd, and it was unnerving. In Land Lakes, Florida, a subterranean void grows. Andrew Foss's team scrambles to save as much as they can as it swallows everything above it. The crew went above and beyond and actually went back in the house as the house started to collapse and grabbed keys, important documents for them, and it was able to move an RV, a boat, their cars, and probably about 15 minutes after that, the ground gave away on that house. As that hole started to grow, it started moving over, and then the whole center just fell out from underneath them. Florida is dominantly underlain by limestones. It's a very common area for sinkholes. It's not the only area. There's limestones all through um, kind of the Midwestern and Eastern US and even into Canada. It was pretty scary. I've never seen anything like it before. Watching the road crumble away, watching the house, just it was loud. There was a lot of noises. You wouldn't think so, but it was pretty loud. Neighbor had a pool, not one next to us, but the one next to them had a pool. We saw that go down. The hot tub went down. Cars, boats, bedroom set, furniture, belongings, part of a house are all sitting in the bottom of that sinkhole. In fact, there's actually a Corvette that was valued over $100,000 that was a collector item. Extreme events in terms of precipitation are what we'd worry about. 
The more rain that we get, the more depression calls we get. Right now, we just had two weeks of rainy periods. We've had a total of 44 sinkhole calls. In Montecito, California, the debris flow spreads. Emergency services begin to see how enormous the devastation is. I'm right through it. What are we supposed to do? Oh, a transit is about late. Okay, I'm so sorry. Your phone's cutting in and out. What is going on at the address? Well, the house is about to be lost. Oh. The radio started going off with all the dispatch calls for people calling in needing assistance. You need to come to our house. Our house is filled with mud. I have a newborn. We understand that. We're going to die. We'd be up to our necks in mud if we tried to get off our bed. I don't know if we're going to live. Don't go, don't go. In September 2018, Sulawesi, Indonesia is devastated by a 7.5 magnitude earthquake. Uh, earthquake is a result of a sudden movement of two blocks of the crust of the earth uh, against one another. The quake triggers a tsunami and the largest soil liquefaction event ever recorded. 4,300 are killed, over 10,000 are injured, and hundreds of thousands lose their entire communities. Soil liquefaction is a phenomenon that often accompanies earthquakes, and uh, it is a transformation of a solid soil material into a liquid. Uh, that can break foundations or cause buildings to tilt. It's one of the big destructive phenomena that accompany earthquakes. In Montecito, California, as a torrent of mud and debris pummels Marco's home, got it free for everyone here. he does what he can to protect his family. This is literally as high as the kitchen counters. I was feeling the whole house was shuddering when these big rocks and, and tree trunks were hitting it. Stay there. You guys stay there. We sheltered in place in this very small um, hallway. I'm going to try to open that door over there. I barely beat it to our back door, and I opened the back door. We literally have a torrent of mud going through the house. And that ended up saving our lives. I don't know why I acted the way I did, but it was just pure instinct at that point. It's gone down six inches. <laughs> Once we came down onto the Olive Mill Hot Springs area, that we found homes that were destroyed, we found cars that were flipped over, we found boulders, tree trunks. We found the debris and the chaos. We started searching for people and had no idea if we were gonna find anyone that was still around that was alive. If this was just gonna be body recoveries, we weren't sure. It was really bad. In Lillooet, British Columbia, Probably all my life I've been interested in vintage cars. I got my Morgan in 1988 and uh, I've babied it ever since then. Glenn Sorco is a retired pilot. Now he has the time to indulge his passion for classic cars as one of the members of the Pacific Morgan Owners Group. In August 2018, the group is taking a scenic drive through rural British Columbia led by Glenn's good friend, Tom Morris. When we left Vancouver, the weather that day, there was not a cloud in the sky. It was absolutely gorgeous. And of course, you get in the mountains, and the weather changes. On our way to Cache Creek, we hit the worst storm I think I've ever been in. It was like buckets of water thrown against the windshield. The hail was at least the size of my thumb. We're seeing an increase in precipitation in our warming climate in British Columbia. And if this uh, is accompanied by extreme events, uh, heavy rainfall events, then we're going to see a lot more debris flow activity. It got so bad that Tom couldn't see the center line of the road. And it was very, very dark. Your lights weren't doing any good whatsoever. When he stopped, I pulled up beside him 
and he said, I'm going to put the top up, and uh, I said, fine, I'll just go ahead and find a safe place. I don't know, 200 yards ahead of him, and uh, then I walked back to see him, and he says, I think we'll wait for the other cars. And uh, I just walked back to my car. When I got to it, just all hell broke loose. California. In Montecito, Andy Rupp battles impossible conditions during his rescue efforts. We tried to make access to a neighborhood that a couple of calls had come in from people stuck in their attics. The vehicle wasn't going to be able to make it because the mud was too deep and we couldn't see the road at all. I grabbed a ladder, carrying it on my shoulders, and started walking, you know, in down the road. And pretty soon I found out that I was in the mud up to the ladder. My captain said, well, what are you going to do when you get there? And I went, oh, yeah, good point. We can get up there and say hi, but then I'm not bringing them out through this mud, so they're probably safer in the attic than they are for us going in. From start to finish, the debris flow took only about 30 minutes. It was a very, very fast moving event. Boulders the size of SUVs were floating on top of the, the mud and debris. You could see four dozen cars stuck in the mud and not moving. Everywhere you looked, there was mud and debris covering everything and creating a new landscape. We didn't know that there were swimming pools around. That was a huge hazard. Uh, you could step into a pool and disappear, and no one would find you because of the mud. Debris flows actually can bulk up as it moves down a stream course. It can grow in size, become a monster that actually can travel uh, much farther than other types of landslides. Marco Farrell has been trapped in his home all night with his parents, fighting for survival. As time passed, it started raining again, and I really felt we needed to do something. We dodged the first wave. I felt that if there was a second wave, we wouldn't survive. It was uh, 5.40 or so, and, and the, the very first rays of light were starting to pop up in the east, and I knew, OK, this is go time, and went back in and, and brought my mom out and said, oh, OK, here we go. We're going to get somebody to, to help us. There were electrical power lines down all over the place. There were gas mains that were sheared off and hissing. They sound like jet engines. It was a massive, chaotic event that looked like a war zone. We had cars that were up on top of debris piles. We had still a, a river running through part of the area. You had huge boulders. You had trees down. We had a report from uh, two of our members that they found a woman who was on about a six-foot debris pile. She had some injuries to her legs and had some wires wrapped around her legs, but was conscious, knew what was going on. We ended up getting her onto a backboard, cutting her free of the wires, and carrying her a couple hundred yards up to where the ambulance could, could pick her up and take her into the hospital. She thought she lived across the road. She said she had three other family members with her and pointed across the way. Andy heads in the direction she indicates and finds another massive debris pile, hoping he can locate her family members. The debris pile was probably 75 feet long, 20 feet wide, 12 feet high, and had two vehicles that were up on top of it. So I climbed up on it, looked inside the vehicles with a flashlight, checked the cab, no one was in there, came down off the debris pile and was talking to Captain Hauser. He goes, did you hear that? Someone's calling for help. It's coming from this pile. Uh, and got down, listened underneath the top of a house had ripped off and was sitting on the pile. And sure enough, I could hear someone calling out. In 2017, as the citizens of Sierra Leone recover from a civil war, thousands built homes on Sugarloaf Mountain on the outskirts of Freetown. After weeks of three times the normal rainfall, an entire side of the mountain collapses, leaving more than 1,100 people dead or missing. 
anything in the path of a landslide of that size moving at that speed uh, would just be totally eradicated from the landscape. Um, the power uh, is, is huge. In a cruel irony, people already in deep poverty with virtually no carbon footprint are the most vulnerable to extreme weather. We see that all across the globe with countries that are likely to be most affected by climate change yet have very low carbon footprints. In Montecito, California, the search for survivors begins. Mark Hall's team looks for people who have been trapped by the massive debris flow that has swept over the town. We had just come out of the Montecito Creek debris flow area. We noticed that there was a light shining out of the vent of an attic and someone yelling, screaming for help. So that was literally where we started our, our rescues. We had to um, cut our way through a fence, swim through probably six feet of mud and debris in their backyard to, to get to the house. And it was a family of two adults and, and three children, including a newborn. We ended up cutting out one of the windows, rescuing that family out through the windows into some of our inflatables. Once we finished with the first family, we literally went door to door doing exactly the same thing. Across town, Andy Rupp races against time to save a young girl who is buried beneath a massive pile of debris. You know, so I asked how many uh, people were in there. She assured it was just herself. Uh, she said she didn't think she was injured. She had confirmed that she was that woman's daughter. And then it was a matter of trying to figure out how to get her out of this massive debris pile. There was a large tree that was down that was running up the debris pile. I went up that, was shining my light down into the pile. She couldn't see the light. And we just started pulling more and more debris off of there. So it was extremely difficult to find her because this debris pile is so big and there's so much mud in there. I can hear her, but I can't see her. I moved this tiny little tree branch and she said, ow. And I said, what are you saying ow to? She said, you've got my hair. And I looked carefully and I could see some hair going back to this big dirt ball. And I poked it with one finger and went, is this your head? And she said, yeah, it's my head. I went, oh, kind of a relief. Oh, I know where you are now. And then at the same point, oh, that's so much worse than I thought. <laughs> Lillooet, British Columbia. In the winding mountain roads, Glen Sorco's vintage car club encounters a sudden change in weather that delivers torrential rain. I heard the massive noise. All I had time to do was look around behind me and hang on to my car and try to deflect with my foot anything I could. The flow did not cease. The major onslaught was just a mass of like a tidal wave coming down or a dam busting. And then after that, there was just unbelievable amount of flow of water. Debris flows are high speed type of landslides and they can travel faster than you can run. They can move at 20, 30 uh, kilometers an hour, um, you know, twice as fast as a human can run. I had not let go of the car because the flow was that strong. I got the deflected force. Tom's car took the force and both Tom and his wife were washed away. As soon as I was safe, now it was to look for Tom and Val. And I went down, found him, and signaled to him I was going downriver to look for Val. And I went say, a kilometer down the river, and I just looked as far as I went, there was no chance she was going to be alive. Montecito, California. Three hours after the debris flow, Andy Rupp has located the young girl trapped under a pile of debris but one false move could crush her. So the mud that she was in came up to about her torso. So her face was within six inches of the mud. 
I thought then, you know, this is gonna be such a nightmare, right? Every time you move something, it could collapse in on her. We were fortunate that we had battery powered tools which used to, to cut open cars. We couldn't use a chainsaw because of the, the gas link that was around, so we couldn't use anything that could ignite the gas. I had the handle and I started the throttle on it. She's been so great and so calm in there. And as I'm making that last cut, she starts to scream in pain. And then as soon as it cut through, there was this sigh of relief and you can see her moving around and I went, oh, I can't believe that that was it. She was able to climb right out and walk over to the gurney with some assistance. You know, physically seemed fine. The Swiss Alps, home to the Matterhorn, one of the most iconic mountains on the planet. But temperatures in the Alps are increasing twice as fast as the global average, which means these snow-capped peaks are literally melting before our eyes. The Alps have been suffering for the last few decades because of warmer and warmer winters and summers. They're not getting as much snowfall, um, and the summers, the snowfall is melting off faster. In the past, even 50 or 100 years ago, those high rock mountains like the Matterhorn would be frozen. Imagine that the ground is frozen year round. It's solidly frozen. And now the ice is, is thawing and melting and water is moving down into the joints and the cracks in the rock. And that is exerting pressures on the rock that lead them to uh, fail. When the Matterhorn's ice begins to fail, the mountain may become so destabilized that it could cause massive landslides. Montecito, California. As day breaks, residents begin to comprehend the scale of the devastation that has overtaken their community. This is one of the first moments to really stop and look around and see the devastation. The houses that are gone are, are completely gone and they're covered in mud. So the days that follow directly after the debris flow were challenging and I think mentally difficult on a lot of the rescue workers here. Turned into a body recovery. So we have dogs coming in that are cadaver dogs. You're looking for bodies and that's just, it's a mentally stressful thing that I've never had to do. And there were still two people that were never found. You can see the height of where the debris came up. In some places, it came up 30, 40 feet high. There were over a 1,000 homes destroyed and families that were displaced from their residences. Over the course of the next two to three days, many of them were helicoptered out of their residences because there was no one that could get there. There's always the concern that you would be either rescuing or recovering somebody that you knew. That's something that weighs heavy. It makes it hard. I go back, I get dad and, and our dog out, and right as the firemen pull up and I was able to get us onto the truck and evacuate us. Freeway, I, I looked back and there was the most brilliant rainbow over that line of clouds over Montecito. And that's when I knew, you know, we're, we, we survived this, we survived this. In Lillooet, British Columbia, the mudslide relents. Glenn Sorko is forced to abandon the search for his friend Val. He returns to help her husband, Tom. There was a big flow still and rocks and that going by me. I wanted to get to Tom. I went down, I got Tom over to a place we could get a rope to him and then pulled him up. My main job was warming him up, plus to talk and yell at him uh, to save him from going in a coma. We had people call the ambulance and the police and everybody got notified. While Tom is taken to the hospital, Glenn realizes that his car, battered by the debris flow, is his only way back to town. Police didn't want me anywhere near the car. They didn't want me to take the car. They said, you're on your own. So the whole way back, I said to my wife, it's the loneliest drive I have ever done in my life. 
Montecito, California, the site of the mysterious fireball. Mark Hall surveys the damage. This used to be the bridge that connected Park Lane with um, uh, the San Ysidro Inn. This was the flashpoint of the initial debris flow. We had a high tension gas line that went under the bridge that when the debris flow came down and took away the bridge, it exploded and blew up uh, these houses here. The level of the creek has been gouged out about 30 feet just from the force of the, of the rocks and debris. You can see some of the size of the boulders that came down. It was a very quiet, tranquil creek. Now what you see is a massive scar of where things have been literally uh, excavated out by rocks and debris. First scientists think of geologic time in terms of uh, how long the Earth has existed. We live an average of maybe 75 or 80 years. That's just a drop in the ocean of geologic time. A landscape formed over millions of years is utterly transformed in an instant. The survivors begin to dig out from the masses of Earth that have landed on them. It was awe-inspiring that the, the amount of of uh, destruction, total devastation that, that all of this debris had exacted on us. Had I to do this all over again, obviously I would heed the concerns and, and evacuate. I would also spend more time trying to warn our neighbors. We lost friends and we lost neighbors. I'm gonna be the one ringing the bell to get out, get out, get out, get out. As the ground beneath our feet reacts to the profound changes triggered by humanity, these landslides and sinkholes are just the beginning of major changes in the geosphere. We pay a price for our meddling with certain cycles. You got to be a little prepared when you live in California. Mother Nature is always going to rear her head every couple years or so often. And you can prepare to some degree, but you can't prepare for everything. Around the globe, we're actually seeing a big increase in the number of landslides and mudslides that are happening over the last couple of decades. Big ones, fatal ones, much more of them happening. And we're also seeing, in step with that, a lot more extreme rainfall at those locations that's triggering these events. It can let go at any time. And if you happen to be there, guess what? As the planet warms, we are changing the fundamentals of its geology. Continued thawing of permafrost increases the chance of large mudslides in the north. Intensified precipitation can trigger sinkholes and larger mudslides. And as the ice caps on mountains melt, the glue that holds these geological structures together is dissolving. Most terrifying of all, a potential collapse of the Greenland ice sheet could melt 684,000 cubic miles of ice into the ocean, triggering tsunamis, earthquakes, and volcanoes across the northern hemisphere, shifting the Earth's crust beneath a massive weight redistribution. We can actually have earthquakes triggered as a result of uh, the removal of snow and ice due to climate change. Nowhere on the planet is safe from the effects of mutant Earth. These geological processes have already begun, and they will continue for hundreds or even thousands of years. So people have actually talked about us living in the Anthropocene right now, humans' interaction on the geologic time scale. Every unit of CO2 that we put into the atmosphere changes the future of the planet on hundreds to thousands of years time frame. Most profound of all, the pace of these geological changes has accelerated. Processes that should take millions of years are now occurring in just decades. Climate change is affecting this, these systems so quickly that within a generation, we are having an imprint on these systems that is more than a geologic time change. And with things happening, so fast now and accelerating on an annual basis. We're not talking decades, we're talking every year things are accelerating faster than many scientists studying them could have even imagined. The change in climate that we're seeing is really rapid, much more rapid than we've seen in the geologic record. Um, it's not an esoteric problem. This is a real world hazard to people. As we move into the future, the climatic conditions just seem to be getting worse and worse. 
it's going to happen, and it's just a matter of uh, when and how, how badly it's going to happen. We live on mutant Earth now. The stability that humanity has relied on for thousands of years is gone, and we are just beginning to understand the mutant.